Happy New Year, Discovery Class. We're starting into a brand new year. We've been studying together the book of Genesis and the life of a man named Joseph. It takes up almost a third of the whole book of Genesis. Let me pick up the thread for you. If you're new and you haven't been along, this will help you along. In our story today, Joseph is 37 years old. He grew up in Canaan, in the land of the Hebrews. He's now residing in Egypt. He speaks two languages. He's married now. It's monogamous. He has one wife. And he has two sons. Two boys. If you were to ask Joseph to sum up his life so far, he could probably sum it up in just two words. And the two words are the names of his sons. The one was Manasseh and the other was Ephraim. The name Manasseh means, I want to forget. That's what it means. The word Ephraim, his second son's name, means twice fruitful. The Lord has blessed me. In naming his sons, Joseph was explaining to everyone, and even explaining it to the Lord, that God had made him forget all his disturbing past, even those in his father's household. And next, God made him fruitful in a foreign land. Joseph gave his children names, and those names would reveal his attitude towards his God. His boys were reminders of God's activity in his life. One, God made him forget all those stings of yesterday. Two, God made him fruitful. All things are now going to be made right. Joseph was filled with gratitude towards God, even in spite of all that had happened to him. And I want today, I want you to watch what's going to take place in his thankfulness. You pick up the story in verse 33, or 53 rather, of Genesis chapter 41. Let me read. When the seven years of plenty, which had been in the land of Egypt, came to an end, the seven years of famine began to come. Then there was famine in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. The people cried out to Pharaoh for the bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, I want you to go to Joseph. Whatever he says for you to do, I want you to do it. And when the famine was spread over all the face of the earth, then Joseph opened all the storehouses and he sold to the Egyptians bread. Do you know, when I read that story, it's almost too hard to believe. Here's a boy in his teens, prisoner in a dungeon. And from being a prisoner in the dungeon, he's now got the keys to the king's vaults for all the king's food. The famine spread over the entire face of the earth. That sounds like our present COVID, doesn't it, to you? COVID-19? I don't think there's been any nation on earth that I know of that's been avoiding it. Everybody caught it. So the famine in Joseph's time left every nation on earth suffering for food. And the famine was so wide that it kept spreading. Now there's a lesson here that I want all of us to learn today from this boy, Joseph. And he's gonna teach us three things. Here they are. One, constant pain is not your enemy. Two, past behavior should not derail your present. Three, 
Great success should not stop or interfere with your service. These three lessons not only apply to Joseph, but they apply to us today. What Joseph learned, we're going to learn. What turned Joseph around is also going to turn us around. I want you to look at them with me. Here's the first one. Constant pain is not your enemy. This is a very helpful principle, I think. Joseph was 17 years old when his brothers threw him down there in that cistern in Canaan. His pain began when he was just a teenager. And for the next 13 years, Joseph's journey is going to be filled with affliction. It wasn't fair, the way that he was treated. And he didn't have a thing to do with it. He didn't bring it on. It wasn't until he was 30 years of age, here in this story, before he stood before Pharaoh and he learned that pain was not his enemy. For 13 years of his life, it was nothing but a roller coaster, up and down, inside out, one setback after another. Does that describe you? If it is, how did you handle it? Has your life too gone from bad to worse? You were in constant pain. Maybe some of it was physical. Some of it maybe was mental. Could have been 13 years. Maybe it's been longer for you. Hmm? Do you know what I've noticed in reading Joseph's journey? I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but I'll tell you what I found. Joseph never complained. As I read the text, verse upon verse, chapter upon chapter, I never hear of anything in Joseph about him complaining. He was in deep pain and severe suffering. But it wasn't his enemy. He does tell of a fellow prisoner. Remember the cupbearer in Pharaoh's court put in prison with Joseph? In his innocence, Joseph asked, he said, Will you remember me when you go back to Pharaoh? That I'm down here because of something I never did? The Bible tells us that the cupbearer forgot. He didn't remember it at all. Even though Joseph had paid him a tremendous favor. What'd that do for Joseph? Make him bitter? No. Seemed to make him better. He served the prison warden faithfully, just as he did before. Constant pain was not his enemy. Marian Anderson was the first African-American to perform in the Metropolitan Opera in New York. She sang in the most renowned music theaters and opera houses all over Europe, as well as all over the United States. She was born in Philadelphia to a very poor black couple who also had two other daughters. In the prime of her career, the newspapers, they came to her and said, Miss Anderson, what would you say was your greatest moment for your success? Could you tell us what was your greatest achievement? Well, she could have given a lot of answers. She could have said, well, it was probably the night that I was in the Metropolitan Opera in New York and the conductor was Toscanini, one of the greatest conductors that ever lived. And he paid me the highest compliment and said that I was the best contralto that the world had ever heard sing. She didn't mention that. Nor did she mention that her greatest moment was when she was the guest soloist at the White House. At the time, it was President Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor, and they had as their house guest the King and Queen of England. And who was the music? Marian Anderson. She could have mentioned that, but she didn't. Or, she could have mentioned the time when she stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And it was a time of the civil rights rally. 
And there before all those people in the Lincoln Memorial, there witnessed 75,000 admirers. And they heard her sing, God bless America. That could have been her big night. No, that wasn't it either. Do you know what Marian Anderson answered to those newspaper writers? This was her greatest moment. She told them it was the day that she came home to her mother's house. And she said to her mother, Mama, you don't have to take in any more wash ever again. I'm going to look after you. Through Joseph's constant pain, that was not his enemy. He told the people of Egypt, you need not fear the famine or running out of food. I'm going to look after you. Does God speak those words to you in your pain? He tells us that he will look after us. I will never leave you or forsake you, the book says. Do you believe that? Here's a second lesson that Joseph learned. Past behavior should not derail the present. I don't know of a pastor. I don't know of a priest or rabbi or a pope who has not been stung by the yellow jacket's poison of hurts and malignment. We all have memories. Many people have done us in. Have you ever had hate mail? Did any ever, everyone ever tell you that you're a liar? What about those ugly rumors that you endured? Have any of you had a Potiphar's wife experience? When you were writing your paper at university, you were told by the instructor that you were a plagiarist. It wasn't your writings at all. They were somebody else's and you copied them. You were constantly put down. Your self-confidence was totally destroyed. Maybe you're on Facebook and all it's turned out to be is a gossip call. Does your past behavior derail your present? Do you feel you're no good anymore? Most of what I've described happened to Joseph. Do you know why it didn't hurt him? He reminded you because of his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, those two sons. Their names meant the train was back on the track. Twice fruitful, the Lord is going to bless me. Bad memories can be very slimy. Don't let, don't let them defeat you. Release them and let them go. Begin all over again. Twice fruitful, blessed. Don't be defeated by past behavior. This past week, I conducted a funeral service for one of our classmates here at our church. He was a medical professor across the street at the University of Calgary. And he was a prof professor there for almost 30 years, teaching young medical students how to become a doctor. I never met a more humble man. He and his wife, Joyce, have been here in the church for a long time now. They have four children. Two of their children are medical doctors. His name is Dr. Wayne Elford. If you pinned all his degrees and all his citations on the wall, you'd probably run out of wall space. Medical students from his classes are serving all over the world. Dr. Alford never hung any of those citations on his wall. He just put them on the bottom shelf under his drawer, including even the Order of Canada. Nobody even knew he had it. 
Dr. Alfred's expertise in medicine was very well known. A lot of his research made it into the famous medical journals. Consequently, he was invited around the world to lecture to students in many countries. Wayne told me a story of one of those adventures, and I'll pass it on. It happened when he was addressing 200 doctors, the most brilliant minds in the country, in Saudi Arabia at the University of Mecca. Remember, Mecca is home to the Mohammeds. That's where Mohammed grew up, and that's where he founded the Muslim faith. It was way back in the year 600 AD. Every practicing member of that faith is urged in his lifetime once to try and make a pilgrimage to Mecca. And that practice is called the Hajj. And it's held every year. And Muslims from all over the world by the millions, they come to celebrate that holy week. Well, that isn't the week that Wayne was there. He was just there on an off week, somewhere down the middle of the calendar year. He came to Saudi Arabia to address those students at Mecca. But not being a Muslim and unable to stay in Mecca because it's really reserved for those that are part of the faith, he was placed in a lovely hotel over on the ocean, about an hour's drive away from Mecca. It was a seaport and had international airport and many of the pilgrims, when it was time to come to the Hajj, they would land there and then they would take the hour drive over to Mecca. When they traveled, there was a beautiful highway built between that seaport and Mecca just for those pilgrims. Gorgeous highway, probably the best highway you could find on earth. And it was called the Highway of Righteousness. Meaning, those that were faithful and those that were righteous, they were making their way over to meet their God there in the town of Mecca. Okay, it's time for Wayne to do the lectures. That morning, when he got down to the parking lot, his vehicle was a Jeep, a nice modern four-wheel drive Jeep. However, he didn't travel on the highway of righteousness because he wasn't permitted. Well, how did he get there? Well, a four-wheel drive Jeep, he drove over the desert, parallel to the highway, and he made his way to the students. Don't you find that a bit strange? Here's one of the finest medical professors on earth talking to the 200 of the best young medical doctors you could find anywhere there in the land of Saudi Arabia. And the only way he could get there was by Jeep over the sand dunes to their presence. Don't you think that would really bother you if you were a professor? You couldn't go on the super highway? No, not Wayne. He looked at it and he thought, hmm, I guess that's my travel. I want to talk to those students. If this is how I'm going to get there, I guess that's what I'll do. When he got home, he told the story to his family. And he said, how did you get over there then, Dad? Well, he said, you know, I think I traveled on the highway of unrighteousness through the dunes in the sand. Past behavior should not derail our present. Wayne rode by Jeep through the sand to give the students the best lecture from the best professor that he could deliver. What Joseph had to give to the starving people in Egypt, sort of like Wayne, was greater than his mistreatment in his past. He held the keys to the silo vault just ask me. I have an answer for your hungry tummies, said Joseph. I will feed you. Okay, here's a third lesson he teaches us. Great success should not stop your service. Joseph 
leaving Canaan, was thrust into the most corrupt society in the ancient world, Egypt. They were immoral. They were a people that were adulterous. They were warlike. They were fierce. They were atheistic. They were polluted, sensual. How could a 17 year old survive in a furnace of debauchery like that? The Bible tells us that Joseph followed his father's God. The Lord was with Joseph to protect him. The Lord is with Joseph to guide him. The Lord is with him to give him his victory. He was loyal. He was hardworking. It seemed he was duty bound. You could certainly trust him. What did that do for him? Well, as I read the story, I find that it made him very patient. I found that he was quite enduring. I found he was quite forgiving, certainly sincere, and nobody's gonna question his success. For most of us, that would probably go to our heads. You've heard the experience, knowledge is power. Joseph knew that there was a famine coming. Joseph knew what the famine was. He knew the when, and he also knew how long. If you were Joseph, pretend you were, but you're corrupt. You could have been the wealthiest man on earth. With that knowledge and with that power, he could have had a monopoly on all the grain and all the bounty in the whole land of Egypt. He could have built private silos, filled them with stolen grain, stored them in sheds that would be terribly overflowing and ready for the killing. And when the famine came, bingo. Overnight riches. But it would be an inside job. Not even Pharaoh would know. Vladimir Putin, the dictator in Russia today, he's playing that trick with the people of Russia. He's giving favors to all his oligarchs and he's doing it on the backs of all his countrymen. And as a result, his henchmen are becoming billionaires. Not Joseph. The source of his knowledge wasn't him. God told him what the secret was. It wasn't Joseph. Great success should not stop your service. You ever heard of the term Cups? Cups is a charity right here in our city in Calgary. And it watches over the homeless. And its job is to get the street people off the street and it's to put food in the hands and the mouths of the beggars. And in these hard times, I think those people are run off their feet. Some years ago, here in the Cups downtown office, a beggar, a bag lady, she came to the back door of their downtown store and she was given clothing, a warm sleeping bag, and some food. The next morning, an ambulance was rushed to the back door of the Cups building. The garbage truck that morning, early, making its rounds up that alley, being dark, the driver didn't see the sleeping bag in front of the garbage bin. The driver ran over that sleeping bag. Inside that sleeping bag was a person. And that person had been served by cups. That day, 
for their need, rushed to the hospital, that person died. Do you know who she was? She was the bag lady who had just received her handout and she was sleeping in the alley. However, the alley wasn't her home. She lived in one of the most beautiful homes in one of the most beautiful downtown subdivisions that Calgary has. She owned property. She owned investments. The lady was extremely wealthy. She pretended she was poor. She played the role of a street person, alone, homeless. She wanted to see how cups operated, how society treats people that have nothing. Thus her backdoor experience and her sleeping in the alley took her life. When her will was probated after her death, do you know what she did? She had left her entire fortune to that charity called Cups. And in her honor, the Cups organization built the best doctor's facilities you would ever find. On their premises, they also built the finest dentist offices and best chairs of any dentist office. They built the most appealing consulting rooms, large dining hall, kitchen facilities that would feed hundreds. That wealthy bag lady left her comfortable palace to give her life so that those less fortunate could be served. She was Joseph. Great success should not stop your service. When you come back next week, you're going to learn that this famine has gone all the way over to the land of Canaan. That's where Joseph's family lives. What do you think his family's going to do when they get starving and they're hungry? Do you suppose Joseph is going to have anything to do with their salvation? Well, I think you ought to come back next week and we're going to take another look at it a little closer and I'm going to tell you what happened. Until then, I want you to have a good week. I'll see you then.